My dad gifted me a huge villa, but I found it too luxurious, it didn't fit with my image as an artsy, literary type on campus. After visiting once, I left it and used. A month later, a new freshman joined our school's club. He claimed the villa was his, and he also said his dad was the richest man in the world. Looking at the short, chubby freshman with a face full of acne, I found myself deep in thought. Chapter 1. I'm the president of our university's art club. Art is all about talent. I don't want people to think that my art is made with money. So, I've never told anyone that my dad is the richest man in the world. Originally, I was happily keeping my identity hidden while playing the role of the campus heartthrob and casually dating my cute girlfriend. Then one day, a freshman with a face full of acne was brought into the club by a group of excited members. He said his dad was the richest man in the world. My first thought was, did the richest man change? Until he pulled out his phone and flashed a picture of my dad, Martin, then held it up next to his own face with a smug grin and said, my dad and I look like we were cut from the same mold. I was stunned. I quickly called my dad and asked when he had given me a brother. My dad swore a deadly oath that I was his only son, and I believed him. Is your dad really Martin? I asked the freshman skeptically. That's right. I'm his only son. My name is Charles Lin. He boasted. My anger started rising. Does Martin know he has a son like you? But I didn't plan to expose him right away. I wanted to see what he was up to by pretending to be me. Noah. Let Charles join the club. He said we could have a barbecue at his villa this weekend. Alex, one of the members, said excitedly, Sure, give me your student ID so I can register you, I said, reaching out to Charles. He hesitated but eventually handed me his ID. I opened his ID card and saw that his place of birth was listed as a city. Puzzled, I asked, Isn't the richest man from B-City? Why is your birthplace a city? Charles responded quickly and smoothly, My family's ancestral home is in a city but we're currently settled in B-City. What a city. My family's ancestral home is in B-City. He was clearly banking on no one actually checking, which is why he dared to lie so boldly. My dad is very private and has always kept our family's information well hidden, which gave Charles the opportunity to take advantage. You said you're taking us to your villa for a barbecue this weekend, I asked. Looking up from the registration form, a flash of pride crossed Charles's eyes. That's right. My dad bought me a villa in Zijing Terrace, not far from school so I can stay there whenever I want. A bad feeling flashed through my mind. Could the villa he's talking about be the one my dad bought for me a month ago? I visited it once, and while it was certainly grand, it was too big for me to live in alone. The decor was overly extravagant, not at all to my taste, so I left it and used. How did it suddenly become his? The club members excitedly surrounded Charles, a villa belonging to the richest man. Can I come? Charles, count me in. I want to go too. Charles didn't turn anyone away. Smiling generously as he said, anyone who wants to come is welcome. The members all cheered in unison. I smirked to myself. The villa's door has facial recognition and fingerprint access, and only my information is registered in the system. I'm curious to see how Charles plans to get into the villa. Chapter 2. My girlfriend Fernanda invited me to have lunch in the cafeteria. Fernanda is a student council officer, and although her family background is average, she is very graceful, ambitious, and utterly devoted to me. After dating for two years, I decided it was time to reveal my true identity and introduce her to my parents. Fernanda, have you heard of Martin's son? She took a couple of bites of her food and looked at me with surprise. Are you talking about that freshman Charles? I choked on my food, nearly getting it stuck in my throat. Fernanda quickly patted my back and scolded me with concern. How can you still choke like a child while eating? I didn't expect even Fernanda had heard about this false rumor. This put me in a rather passive position. After thinking for a few seconds. I decided not to reveal that I am the son of the Lin family before exposing this fake Charles, so Fernanda wouldn't think I was joking. Yes, that Charles. I haven't interacted with him. I don't know him. I thought so. Fernanda is always with me. So how could she know anything about a rich kid? So, I dropped the topic. After finishing her meal, Fernanda said she had something to do and hurried off. Since I had nothing planned for the afternoon, I stayed there, slowly finishing my meal, as I ate. Someone suddenly sat down in the seat across from me. I thought Fernanda had returned, but when I looked up, it was Charles. Noah. I didn't know Fernanda was your girlfriend. Charles sat down arrogantly and smirked. I've taken a liking to her. Why don't you step aside and name your terms? My upbringing always taught me to be humble and never boast. So, as the true heir to the richest family, I had never said such arrogant words in my 20 years. But today, I heard them from a fraud. I sneered with malice. Then tell me. What kind of terms can you offer? Charles proudly replied, You're in your third year, right? Once you graduate, I can recommend you to work at Lin Sheng Group. He held up seven fingers. You could earn this much a year. Is that all? I laughed. 
So, you're saying you have nothing to offer right now, and you just want to make an empty promise? Charles didn't back down at all. Noah, I hope you can have a broader vision and not just focus on the small benefits in front of you. His condescending attitude disgusted me. I carefully looked him over from head to toe and then coldly said, You claim to be the eldest son of the Lin family, but I don't believe it. I noticed his pupils dilate for a moment, but he quickly regained his composure. Whether I'm the eldest son of the Lin family, you'll know once I take you to the mansion this weekend, right? Who says having a mansion proves you're Martin's son? I sneered. Maybe that mansion is just rented. I stood up, walked over to him, flicked his hair that was permed and dyed, and smirked. Your hair looks flashy, but it's thinning. You must not take good care of it, right? I forcibly grabbed his hand. Oh, you wear a lot of rings, but why are your palms full of calluses? Like someone who works in the fields all year, does the eldest son of the Lin family need to do manual labor? I then pinched his clothes. Your outfit, pants, and shoes are all big brands, carefully maintained, but they don't match your vibe at all. Your style is really awkward. Could it be these clothes were stolen? Charles, who was already feeling guilty, was provoked by the word stolen and snapped. You're crazy. Before storming off without looking back, I chuckled. Could he really be a thief? Chapter 3 Fernanda's family isn't well off. When we first got together, she was timid, dark skinned, and skinny. Later, I helped her improve her diet and introduced her to my social circle. I even paid for her daily necessities, clothing, and accessories. Watching her transform from a shy girl into a bright, cheerful young woman, admired by her classmates and secretly liked by boys, filled me with a sense of accomplishment. I was confident that Fernanda's heart belonged solely to me, let alone this fake Charles, who is short and unattractive with lies that don't hold up under scrutiny, even if he were truly the son of the richest man, I was certain Fernanda would choose me over him. So, I didn't take Charles's provocation seriously at all. After all, this clown will be exposed for what he has come the weekend. Why bother getting worked up? That night, a video of my conversation with Charles in the cafeteria was posted on the campus network. Genius versus Prince. Cast your vote to see who will win the beauty's heart. The post was pinned to the top, and in no time, the number of votes started skyrocketing. What I never expected was that the votes for Charles were far more than those for me. I scrolled through the comments, and someone said, between a handsome guy and the chance to avoid 30 years of hard work, I choose the latter. Another comment read, in the face of capital, talent means nothing. Is everyone this realistic? It made me feel like hiding my identity as a wealthy and handsome guy was a foolish move. And is everyone this blind? Charles's disguise was obviously fake. Why couldn't anyone see that? Not giving up. I kept scrolling and finally found a sensible comment. The ID was Diana, based on Charles's age. Calculating the timeline for Mrs. Lin's pregnancy doesn't add up at all. That year, Mrs. Lin had a full schedule, and photos were released throughout the year, showing no signs of pregnancy. Attached. Photos of Mrs. Lin throughout the year. This junior had sharp eyes, a clear mind, and a logical approach. So I liked her comment. I didn't pay much attention to the opinions of bystanders, and as usual. I headed to the student council to find Fernanda. As soon as I arrived at the student council office, I saw Fernanda being pestered by Charles. I was genuinely furious, using my identity to harass my girlfriend. Charles was really asking for it. Fake prince. Isn't it enough to be a thief? Now you're trying to be a homewrecker too. Charles was already feeling guilty, and being called a fake prince hit him where it hurt. Noah. Who's fake? Charles's face turned dark. I sneered. Do I need to say it again? You're short and unattractive. Who gave you the confidence to impersonate a wealthy and handsome guy? I thought Fernanda was the one being harassed, and I naturally assumed she was on my side, but I didn't expect to be slapped in the face so quickly. Fernanda stepped in front of Charles, frowned, and said to me, Noah, please say less. Chaz isn't what you think. Excuse me. She told me earlier that she didn't know him well, and now she's calling him Chaz. If it's not what I think, then what is it? I stared into her eyes, questioning her. I'm actually an easygoing person. But when it comes to relationships, I have a zero tolerance policy. My girlfriend can be simple or poor, but she can't treat me like a fool. If she betrays me, I'll immediately end things. I was willing to listen to her explanation, but she kept pushing me away. Let me walk you back to the dorm, and I'll explain on the way. I shook off Fernanda, pointed at Charles, and said, No need to go back. Just explain right here in front of him. We have plenty of time. You can explain now. Fernanda stammered, unable to say anything. Charles. Seeing this, smiled smugly and took Fernanda's hand. Noah, why humiliate yourself? The truth is I confessed to Fernanda, and she agreed to give me a chance to pursue her. Fernanda's face didn't look good, but she didn't let go of Charles's hand. On the hand that was holding Charles's, 
She was still wearing the birthday gift I gave her, a watch worth tens of thousands that I had my cousin bring back from abroad. Chapter 4 To describe how I feel at this moment, it would be like being struck by lightning. It's not that I'm deeply in love with Fernanda, but I can't accept two things. First, I was wrong about her, she turned out to be someone who switches sides easily. Second, she abandoned me for a short, unattractive guy with a poorly executed scam. She hadn't even gotten anything from the promises Charles made, yet she defected just like that. If she had checked the prices of the gifts I've given her over the past two years, she wouldn't be so content, would she? I turned and walked away, knowing it was over between Fernanda and me. I have a zero-tolerance policy in relationships, I can't accept a girlfriend who is unfaithful, looking at others while with me. Fernanda chased after me, desperately trying to explain as we walked. Noah, listen to me. Charles asked if he could pursue me. What was I supposed to say? I could only say that it's his freedom. I didn't say anything else. Please, don't be angry. I won't accept him. I only love you. Fernanda clung to my arm, dragging me from the administrative building to the classroom building. Let go. I was so furious I almost laughed. Does she think I'm in kindergarten? That a few words would make me turn back. I didn't want to waste words on her. But Fernanda knew I wouldn't get rough with a woman. So she tried to kiss me, grabbing my hand and pressing it against her waist as I tried to push her away. As we were in a stalemate, someone walked out of the classroom building. This person walked straight up to us, grabbed Fernanda's wrist, and deftly twisted it, pushing her away. Ow. Who are you? Fernanda cried out in pain as she fell to the ground, clutching her arm. The girl turned to me and asked, Are you okay, Noah? Only then did I look at her, a clean head of long hair, with distinct and lively features. Her face seemed familiar. Wasn't she the one who defended me on the campus network? Diana, I blurted out. The girl looked surprised, as if she didn't expect me to know her name. She nodded at me, glanced at the teary-eyed Fernanda on the ground, and asked, What about her? I looked at Fernanda. Fernanda quickly said to me, Noah, believe me, I'll explain everything. Okay. What happened just now was really a misunderstanding. Please ask this outsider to leave first. I felt a deep sadness. Did this two-faced woman always think of me as an easy fool to manipulate? I wasn't going to let her off the hook so easily. If she dared to play me, I would make her regret it deeply. I took out my phone and recorded Fernanda's desperate attempts to reconcile. As I filmed, I said, Fernanda, we've been together for two years. I still have feelings for you. If you repeat what you just said on video, saying that Charles is the one pursuing you, that you have no interest in him, and that you will never accept him, then I'll forgive you. Fernanda, do you dare to say that? I brought the phone close to her face, making sure she could see how pathetic she looked in the video. Her expression shifted from red to green and back to red. I knew exactly what she was thinking. Her makeup was ruined. Her poise was gone. Her grace lost, if she said those words. Forget about being Martin's son. No self-respecting guy would approach her again. And she didn't want to miss out on Martin's son. Noah, there's nothing more to say. Fernanda turned away. Let's break up. Finally getting the outcome I expected. I sneered and calmly turned off the video. Get lost. I said coldly. Fernanda, probably too ashamed to look at me, ran away with her head down. Honestly, I wasn't as calm inside as I appeared on the outside. In that moment, I really wanted to rush over and reveal my identity. Then loudly tell her, idiot. I'm the golden ticket you wanted to catch. You were only a step away from the opportunity, but now it's gone forever. But I didn't. I couldn't break my brooding, mysterious persona. I told myself to look on the bright side, at least I saw her true character before things got any more serious. I turned to thank Diana, but a gust of wind blew sand into my eyes, making me blink. Noah, she's not worth it. Diana, thinking I was crying, said softly, losing you is something she'll regret. Heh, I thought, this girl looks tough, but she's actually quite caring. I know, I said. Chapter 5 The next day, Fernanda and Charles were openly together. When I ran into them in front of the art building, Fernanda was tightly holding onto Charles's arm, ignoring the gossiping students watching them. Charles was strutting around, his smile full of smug triumph. Noah, we meet again. I sneered. The fake prince and the cheating girl. A match made in heaven. Every time I said, fake prince, it made Charles's face change. I watched with interest as his face turned an ugly shade. And I asked him, fake prince, was staging this whole act just to steal my girl worth it? Charles glanced subtly at the watch on Fernanda's wrist, then scoffed. You don't appreciate what you have, but I do. I know Fernanda's value better than you do. Excellent. I could hardly wait to see him come up empty-handed. I'm looking forward to the villa trip this weekend. Charles wanted to continue the verbal sparring, but suddenly, someone slipped their arm around mine, a soft body pressed into me, and I found myself being led away, back toward the building. I looked down at the arm around me, it was Diana, the girl who had helped me yesterday. Surprised. 
I asked. What are you doing here? Diana blinked. Just passing by. Didn't want to see you lose. So I came to give you a hand. I understood her unspoken message. Running into an ex with their new partner. Whoever's alone is the one who's pathetic. She was helping me save face. I nodded and whispered. Thanks, Diana. I let her hold onto me as we walked confidently forward. Under the scrutinizing gazes of everyone around us. Today was the day the art club was having its club meeting. The large lecture hall was packed with people. I had called all the members together because I had something important to announce. Lin Sheng Group had sent an invitation for 50 members of the art club to visit and study at the Ishu Town for a month. To understand the origins of Ishu Town, we need to go back two years. In my freshman year, I was elected president of the art club. In a moment of excitement, I called my dad to share the news. I didn't expect that by the afternoon, the school would receive a massive donation from my dad, specifically earmarked for the art club. If I hadn't strongly objected, my dad would have even flown down to the school to present me with an honorary medal. To solidify my position as the president, my dad invested in building a cultural and artistic hub in the south of the city, named Ishu Town. The town attracted over 2,000 fashion companies, with hundreds of top designers from home and abroad gathering there. Since I didn't want to expose my identity, my dad signed a talent introduction agreement with the school in the company's name. It was publicly presented as a school enterprise cooperation, with entrepreneurship driving employment, creating a hub for fashion industry talent. Every year, the school regularly sends art club members to Ishu Town for training. Over time, people came to believe it was part of the agreement, but they didn't know that all the spots were directly assigned by me, with no relation to the agreement. Once all the members had arrived, I began calling out names. Laura from the Fine Arts Department, Sophia, Daniel, Jessica from Product Design, Angelo. The 50 students listed above, gather at the school gate by 10 a.m. tomorrow to take the bus to Ishu Town for a month of training. The students whose names were called out cheered excitedly. After all, going to Ishu Town was a great opportunity for students. Even a strong advantage for future job applications. I closed the attendance book, ready to go over some important details. But suddenly, Alex, one of Charles's cronies, jumped up and interrupted me. Noah, isn't that a bit too biased? Why did you only pick people who are close to you? Chapter 6 To say I picked people who are close to me is pure slander. First of all, as the president, the most basic requirement is to be fair to everyone. Otherwise, how could I expect a group of top students, who made it into this university, to respect me if I weren't fair? Secondly, I have my own reputation to maintain. Issue Town is a business of my family, and the executives there all know me. If I sent a group of people who are close to me but incompetent, wouldn't it be my own face that gets tarnished in the end? So, even before I could respond, some club members spoke up for me. Why are you saying Noah isn't fair? That's right. Everyone on this list is recognized for their abilities, and most of them are seniors who need internship opportunities. You're just a freshman who doesn't know how things work, so stop talking nonsense. The crony backed down and quickly pushed Charles to the forefront. He nudged Charles with his elbow and whispered, Charles, this is so unfair. Why does Noah get to decide everything? Having been hit where it hurts by me several times already, Charles was already simmering with anger, so he seized the opportunity to stir up trouble. He's right. The art club shouldn't be run by just one person. I suggest we reselect who goes. I didn't even bother to lift my eyelids. Isn't Ishu Town under Lin Shen Group? Who gets to in turn there is up to the Lin family's eldest son. Charles immediately realized things weren't going his way and quickly backed off. My dad is in charge of the company for now, and I won't interfere. It's just arranging a few internships. How is that interfering? I said calmly. Anyone else who wants to intern can go ask the Lin family's eldest son for it. The crony's eyes lit up as he looked at Charles. I sneered. This was what it meant to have a plan backfire. Ignoring Charles's dark expression, I went over some important details with the members who were going to the internship. Announced the activities and competitions for this semester and then dismissed the meeting. After the meeting, Diana invited me to dinner. My first instinct was that she might be interested in me. Since I was hungry too, we decided to have sushi at a place near the school gate. As I ate, I waited for her to confess, but she kept talking about random things without getting to the point. I finally asked, do you like me? Diana's face froze for a moment before she nodded. I've liked you for two years. I was a bit surprised. Then why didn't you ever confess? Diana lowered her head and the usually cheerful person now looked a bit downcast. Just when I was about to, I found out you already had a girlfriend. Oh, I felt a bit sorry for her, but having just gone through a breakup, I wasn't ready to jump into a new relationship so quickly. I was about to turn her down when she suddenly looked up, locking eyes with me. Please don't reject me yet. Hear me out first. She looked at me earnestly. I'm a year younger than you, currently a sophomore majoring in business management. My family is well off, 
And my parents are reasonable people. I understand my own feelings. And my love for you isn't just a passing fancy. I've liked you for two years. And I'm confident I'll continue to like you. Well, I didn't know what to say. Honestly. Hearing her say all this made me feel really touched. Maybe the old saying is true. Someone who's just been through a breakup needs warmth the most. And she was the one giving me that warmth. I was really grateful for it. But I still needed to turn her down. Lee. Before I could finish. Diana's expression tightened. And she hurriedly interrupted me. You don't have to decide right away. Just give me a chance. Let's try dating and see how it goes. Can we? I suddenly found her very endearing. Thinking about it. It seemed like every time she showed up. I ended up feeling happy. So. Why not give it a try? Alright. I smiled. Then I'll be counting on you from now on. Girlfriend. Chapter 7. In my dorm room. One second. I was still reminiscing about Diana's surprised yet cunning expression. The next. I received a call from my dad. A blind date. I couldn't believe it. You want me to go on a blind date? With whom? Dad hesitated. It's with your Aunt Moo's daughter. You used to call her Little Moon when you were kids. Do you remember? You liked playing with her when you were in kindergarten. Wait. Why do I suddenly have to go on a blind date? I was completely baffled. Are we bankrupt? Do I need to marry for business reasons? To be honest. That was the only reason I could think of. Not at all. Dad quickly explained. Actually. Your grandfather arranged a childhood betrothal for you and Little Moon. My head started to ache. What era is this? Who still does arranged marriages? I'm not agreeing to this. We're not asking you to. Dad quickly agreed with me. But your Aunt Moo suddenly brought it up again. And since our families have always been close, how could I refuse? Listen. All I'm asking is that you meet her once. Afterward, I'll tell them you didn't feel a connection. After hanging up the phone, I felt a headache coming on. This blind date, like it or not, I had to go. But, where there's a will, there's a way. The next day, I put on a wig of my roommates with a wild hairstyle, dressed in eye-catching clothes, and took a taxi to the agreed location. I intentionally arrived half an hour late, but to my surprise, the girl hadn't shown up yet. After waiting for another 10 minutes, I spotted an emo girl walking towards me with a swagger that screamed, don't mess with me. I had a bad feeling about this. The emo girl, wearing sunglasses, walked up to me, little stone. It felt my heart is racing like a thousand galloping horses, little moon. Did she really like my crazy look? Before I could say more, the emo girl snatched off my sunglasses and wig. What the? What was she planning to do? I quickly took two steps back, worried she might suddenly go crazy and start hitting me. But then she spoke. Noah. It's me. I looked closely. The emo girl was Diana. Sitting in the cafe, I finally got the full story. Diana, who is Aunt Moo's daughter, had told her mother yesterday that she was pursuing a boy she liked. Aunt Moo, being open-minded and trusting in her daughter's judgment was supportive. However, she suddenly remembered the childhood betrothal that her father and my grandfather, who is my grandpa, had arranged. Since Diana's family moved to Beijing while mine stayed in B-City, and because our families took different paths, we hadn't interacted much over the years, though no one had taken the betrothal seriously, Aunt Mu felt it needed to be addressed. So, she came up with the idea, the two of us would meet for a blind date, and afterward, just say we weren't interested, and the matter would be settled. When she found out that Diana and I were in the same city, this blind date was set up. I couldn't help but laugh at the situation. Diana, on the other hand, was thrilled, saying it was fate that had brought us together. Just then, I got a call from Simon from the product design department. Hello, what's up? I asked. Simon spoke quickly. Noah, we've arrived at Ishu Town. The staff here noticed that several names on the internship list don't match the ones they received. The spots for several students from the animation and design departments were replaced by freshmen like Alex and Luis, who are close to Charles. The meaning was clear, Charles had tampered with the internship list. I suddenly remembered that yesterday, when I left the list on the department teacher's desk, both Fernanda and Charles were present. This must have been their doing. So, they were brazen enough to switch the internship spots even though they knew there were security cameras in the teacher's office. I think I figured out Charles's mindset. He assumed that since the internship slots were arranged by the school, the staff at Ishu Town would only follow the list they received. The students who lost their spots would probably think the change was made on the orders of the wealthy prince and wouldn't dare to cause trouble. He was taking a gamble, but he was destined to lose. After hanging up the phone, I couldn't help but laugh at their stupidity. They were practically asking for trouble. Chapter 8. I made a call to the internship supervisor at Ishu Town. Two hours later, Charles's cronies and the others were sent back in disgrace. Along with them came Supervisor Zhang, who was in charge of the school enterprise cooperation. Supervisor Zhang marched into the office of the art department head, bringing along the cowering students, and laid out the whole story about how they had tampered with the internship list. Naturally, 
Alex and the others weren't willing to take the blame for this and immediately pointed the finger at Charles. When I arrived at the office, I heard Alex, almost in tears, explaining, Supervisor Zhang, it wasn't us who changed the internship list, we just asked Charles to get us a spot, Alex added, sulking. Oh, Charles is the Prince of Lin Sheng Group, his dad is Martin, Supervisor Zhang recognized me, and to prevent him from exposing Charles right then and there, I quickly stepped in, giving him a look that said, not yet. I still wanted to see how Charles planned to get into my villa. Supervisor Zhang cleared his throat. I don't know the eldest son of the Lin family personally, but regardless of who made the mistake, I hope the school will handle this matter fairly and without bias. The department head nodded quickly, assuring that the school would severely punish the culprits, then respectfully saw Supervisor Zhang out. After pulling up the surveillance footage from the office, the truth quickly came to light. It turned out that it was Fernanda, a student council officer, who had tampered with the list. The next day, the school issued a notice, recording a major demerit against Fernanda and revoking her position in the student council. As for Charles, he managed to avoid punishment because he hadn't directly altered the list, but rumors about him faking his identity as the heir to the richest family were spreading like wildfire. Charles didn't dare step outside all day, yet he continued to deny that his identity was fake. He kept insisting that he would take everyone to the villa over the weekend, where he would prove his identity. Fernanda also stepped forward taking all the blame on herself and completely absolving Charles. As a result, everyone unanimously scorned Fernanda, accusing her of having no principles and doing anything to curry favor with Charles. Fernanda, who was used to having everything go her way, couldn't stand the insults and disdain from others. She locked herself in her dorm room, hoping to earn Charles's sympathy, but unfortunately for her, her dream of marrying into a wealthy family was about to be shattered. The weekend arrived quickly. The students who were skeptical of Charles couldn't wait to see the grand villa of the richest family. Charles took this day very seriously, leading a large group of people to the gate of the sieging mountain villa. This is the villa my father bought for me, Charles said proudly, pointing to the huge villa with a smug smile, seeing that there really was a villa. Even the students who were convinced that Charles was lying began to waver. The crowd buzzed with admiration. What a huge villa. No wonder it's the work of the richest family. Fernanda also showed up, her face full of pride as if the villa belonged to her. I had invited Diana to come along to watch the drama unfold. I tilted my head towards Charles and said, the gate only recognizes my information. I'm curious to see how Charles plans to get in. The group watched from outside for a while before Charles finally approached the gate, ready to open it. I thought he was going to unlock it with a fingerprint or facial recognition, so I craned my neck to get a better view. But to my surprise, he pressed the doorbell. The doorbell. Was someone inside the villa? I was stunned. Who could be in the villa? After a moment, a middle-aged woman in her fifties, dressed as a housekeeper, came out of the villa and welcomed Charles inside. Even Diana looked puzzled at this point. I quickly called my dad. Hey, dad, did you hire a housekeeper for my villa? My dad sounded confused. Uh, yes, I hired someone to look after the place, a woman in her fifties. Last name son. Secretary Wang thought it was a nice coincidence since her son goes to the same school as you, so she chose her. Why? Her son goes to the same school as me. It all clicked. It turns out Charles is the son of the woman who was hired to look after my villa. I'm going to fire that housekeeper, and I'm going to press charges against her for bringing people into my property illegally. Chapter 9 When the security guards and police officers arrived, Charles's barbecue party had just begun. Get down. Nobody move. We received a report that you're illegally trespassing on private property. A few police officers flashed their badges, while ten security guards lined up, holding their equipment. A group of college students had never seen anything like this before. They were all stunned. It wasn't until someone explained the situation that the lead officer walked up to Charles and questioned him. You claim to be the owner of this villa. Charles's face turned as pale as a sheet, the fear of having his identity exposed in front of everyone rendering him speechless. He looked desperately at Aunt Sun, hoping she would say something to help him. Don't bother. The officer cut in at just the right moment. His face stern. We've already called the real owner and you have no connection to this property. If you don't start talking, we can take you down to the station for a longer chat. The officer's threat worked, and Aunt Sun threw herself in front of Charles. I'll explain. I'll explain. I'm the housekeeper here, and Charles is my son. He said he wanted to bring his classmates over to hang out. So I agreed, thinking the villa was just sitting empty anyway. It's all my fault. It has nothing to do with Charles. The crowd erupted. Charles is the son of the Lin family's housekeeper, and he had the nerve to claim he's the Lin family heir. Charles, you're incredible. When it comes to shamelessness, I really have to hand it to you. He dared to pull off such a stunt. Amidst the jeers and mockery, Charles began shaking like a leaf, then collapsed to the ground. 
Fernanda's face turned ashen, as if she had seen a ghost. She stared at Charles lying on the ground, as if trying to see right through him. The farce ended with a few students being taken to the police station to give statements, while the rest returned to school. News of Charles impersonating Martin's son, taking advantage of his mother's job as a housekeeper for the Lin family, spread like wildfire across campus, becoming the talk of the town. The school quickly issued Charles a major demerit, but Charles had more than just a demerit to worry about. After buying the villa, my dad had Secretary Wong stock it with all the necessary living essentials, clothing, and accessories, of course, all from luxury brands. The items Charles had been wearing and using to pretend he was a wealthy heir were things he had either stolen or sold from the villa. I had Secretary Wong tally up the losses, and then I filed a lawsuit directly with the People's Court. Charles now faced a compensation claim worth hundreds of thousands of yuan, and if he couldn't pay up, he might end up in jail. On another note, Fernanda, whom I hadn't seen in a while, reached out through a mutual contact to send me a video. She wanted to meet with me. In the video, Fernanda looked haggard holding a fruit knife in her right hand, pressing it against her left wrist. She spoke to me with deep emotion. Noah, I've only ever loved you. I just want to see you one more time. If you don't agree, I'll cut my wrist right here. I'm waiting for you in room 302 at the VIP hotel. I immediately forwarded the hotel name and room number to Charles. From the moment she betrayed me, I had lost all patience with her. Chapter 10. Half a month passed after I orchestrated the meeting between Charles and Fernanda at the hotel. Secretary Wong informed me that Charles had paid off all his debts. I thought the matter was finally over. The money Charles used to repay his debts undoubtedly came from Fernanda. Fernanda probably had no idea how valuable the things I had given her were, but Charles certainly did. However, whether he conned or stole those items from Fernanda, it no longer concerned me. During this time, I was enjoying a relationship with Diana, officially approved by our families. Both our parents were very supportive of our relationship, and as we spent more time together, I found myself increasingly drawn to her. We were financially on par with each other, which made our interactions easy and comfortable, unlike with Fernanda, where I had to constantly be mindful of her feelings. We shared similar values and interests, and there was always something to talk about, even in moments of silence. It never felt awkward. Sometimes I even thought that Charles must have been sent by the heavens to help me. His appearance exposed Fernanda's true nature, and thanks to him, I found a treasure like Diana. In a way, Charles was almost like a benefactor to me. I no longer paid attention to Fernanda and Charles, focusing instead on living my own life. But then one day, another big piece of news spread around the school. Fernanda had attempted murder and was arrested. At around 5 in the afternoon, Diana and I were having dinner when the sound of police sirens and an ambulance rang out, heading towards the lake. By the time we finished eating, we learned from other students that Fernanda had tried to stab Charles, but a passerby had seen it and called the police. Charles had been stabbed in the arm and was taken away by ambulance. Fernanda was detained. A few days later, I got the full story from my classmates. That day, Charles had gone to the hotel room and, after knocking on the door, was met by Fernanda. He originally intended to ask Fernanda for help in paying off his debts. Naturally, Fernanda refused. So, he drugged Fernanda, stole her watch, and secretly took several inappropriate photos of her, planning to use them to blackmail her. After selling the watch and paying off his debt, Charles soon found himself broke again. He didn't want to return to school for fear of being ridiculed by his classmates, but his mother wanted him to face reality, so she kicked him out of the house. With nowhere to go and no money for a hotel, he had no choice but to use the compromising photos to extort money from Fernanda. Fernanda, whose family wasn't well off, had no money for Charles to squander, but Charles didn't believe her, thinking that Fernanda was holding a grudge and refusing to help him out of spite. He questioned her saying that the watch she had was worth hundreds of thousands, so why wouldn't she just lend him a few thousand to tide him over? Fernanda had no idea about the watch and only after pressing Charles did she realize the watch he had taken was worth tens of thousands. She immediately demanded that Charles return the watch, saying it was a birthday gift from me. Charles, of course, didn't believe her and thought it was just an excuse, so, he posted a blurred photo of her on the campus network to scare her. He never expected that this would completely push Fernanda, who was already mentally strained. Over the edge, when Fernanda found Charles by the lake, she didn't hesitate to stab him. If it hadn't been for a nearby student who saw what was happening and called security, Charles would have been stabbed multiple times. The incident caused a huge stir, and the severity of it was beyond belief. Both Fernanda and Charles were immediately expelled from school and soon after sentenced to prison. Later, I went to see Fernanda in jail. When Fernanda saw me, she was full of regret. Her face streaked with tears. She confessed that she had wronged me and that when she invited me to the hotel, she planned to get intimate with me, record it, and if I didn't forgive her, 
She would accuse me of rape to force me to stay with her. She added that she now understood her mistake, believing that heaven was punishing her by letting Charles drug her. Fernanda then asked. Charles said the watch you gave me was worth hundreds of thousands. Is that true? I nodded and said it was. Aside from the watch, the belt I gave you for Valentine's Day and the brooch for New Year's are also quite valuable. You can sell them when you get out to make some money. And by the way, I think it's time I told you. I showed her a family photo on my phone. I'm actually Martin's son. The real deal. The day I invited you to dinner and asked if you knew about Martin's son, I was planning to reveal my identity to you and then introduce you to my parents. Too bad you cheated. But thank you. Your departure led me to true love. I flashed my engagement ring. I'm very happy now. Fernanda broke down. She wept bitterly, cursing Charles loudly, slapping herself repeatedly, and shouting, I was wrong. Give me another chance. Let's start over. The guards had to drag her away. As I watched Fernanda, who seemed completely drained and withered, I couldn't tell if I felt more satisfaction or pity. On the way back, I couldn't help but reflect. To think, the difference between a promising student and a prisoner is just a wall. I sighed. Shaking my head in regret, Diana squeezed my hand a little tighter and said to me, that's why people can be greedy, but not too greedy. If you can't control your desires, they'll end up destroying you. Luckily, in this life, I'm only greedy for you. Feeling a warmth in my heart, I pulled her close and kissed her forehead. Yes, let's agree, only one person to be greedy for, for life.